Hi, my name is Tim Garner. I'm a technical marketing engineer, engineer here at Cisco, and I'm part of the Titration Analytics team. In this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the Titration Analytics security model, how we take the learnings from our application dependency mapping and help customers enforce segmentation in their data center environments. So what is our security model in Titration? Well, probably the first thing that you're also scratching your head right now and thinking, I thought Titration was just an analytics thing, right? Well, you can see as we go through this, we are really rounding out this product with a lot of security features. And as we go forward, you'll see even more security features coming out from Titration as well. But our model that we're going to talk about today is the Protect, Detect and Remediate uh, model. This is allowing customers to understand what in my network should be talking to what. Helping them understand their policy, helping them make those changes to their policy and put that into their environment. Then we're constantly monitoring every packet to detect threats inside their environment. And when we do detect threats, helping them block them instantly. And understanding what was the scope of those threats. Which we do via the remediation stage of our model here, where we can bring in all of that data and help customers, for example, instantly quarantine an endpoint that we know to be exhibiting behavioral anomalies. So, what's the first thing that we need to do? This is a very fancy slide, right? <laughs> wow. This is, this is not mine. I don't have the skills in PowerPoint to be able to do this. So, <laughs> the curse of uh, whitelisting is that you have very limited knowledge about how the applications intertwine with each other. Um, the amount of times where I've spoken to customers where they said, yeah, I, I switched on this particular whitelist policy and the next minute I got a call from every single application owner because I broke everything and I just went home crying. I couldn't even deal with the problem. So the first thing that you need to do to understand and get knowledge is get visibility. And when you get visibility, the first thing that you see most likely is a huge jumbled mess of different application components. So you need to pick them apart and understand the dependencies between both applications inside the application and between applications as well. Now doing that by hand is pretty much impossible. If you have a data center with even a couple of thousand endpoints, there is no way that you're going to understand all the dependencies between those applications. So we like computers. Why don't we let computers solve that problem for us? They're really good at doing this kind of stuff, looking for patterns, identifying those patterns and visualizing those patterns to us. So, what Titration does is looks at every single endpoint. For that endpoint, it calculates a profile of that endpoint. What behavior does it exhibit? What application is it running? What ports does it listen on? Who does it speak to? What time of day does it speak? What type of packets does it send? All of that is used to generate a profile of every endpoint. And then we run those profiles through machine learning algorithms to generate groups. Endpoints that have similar behavior and should be treated similarly on the network when it comes to segmentation. Now those groups, you can even tweak how fine or how coarse you want those groups to be. Do I want to go right down to nano segmentation or am I okay with very generic groups? Everything that serves port 80 to me is a web tier. It's really down to the customer's decision as to where they want to set the limit for their segmentation. Now we correlate these different endpoints together and we build a nice map, <laughs> like solving the uh, Rubik's Cube for you. And between the different groups, we work out, well, what should the ports that need to be open between these groups be? And as you know with whitelisting, if you don't open the port, well then you break the communication between the different groups. Now, when you're looking at telemetry, if you don't have a view of every single packet, there is a non-zero chance that you miss a particular flow that was critical to a, a, an application. Some of those really tiny control flows that might only last for one or two packets, if you're taking a sample, there's a, definitely a statistical chance that you will miss those particular flows. By titration, looking at every single packet, never sampling, what we build into the rules is a direct representation of what we have previously observed on the customer network. There's always this challenge of this thing that's run once at the year's end <laughs> that you won't catch and then it will break. Or once a quarter, you know, the yeah, quarter whatever. summary, yeah. potential summary, yes. Yes, yeah, so um, that's why we put a huge amount of storage into titration because 
What, what I was talking about earlier, the four, the four to six months that we have available is actually available for every single packet to look at. But we do a batch job every six hours and we roll up the application dependency information so we can actually store years worth of data of application dependency maps inside Titration. So the seasonality of applications, my backup job that happens at the end of the month, or my um, Black Friday traffic if I'm a retailer that is different than the rest of the traffic for the entirety of the year, we capture that inside Titration. Yeah, and but that means you need like one year worth of data before you can start doing proper micro-segmentation. So that is a good observation. <laughs> 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 and that really comes down to, you know, what, what customer are we deploying this with? So there are some customers that know that they have seasonal patterns. There are some customers that know that the same traffic over one week is the same as the traffic that is going to be every single week of the year. So that's why when we're deploying titration with them, we often sit down early in the project with them and say, OK, tell us about what you want to, what you want to do. Do you want to wait six months before we do anything, or do you want to go after mo one month's worth of data? Now, uh, the algorithms are designed to be run iteratively as well. So you can run it after one month, run it the next week, run it the week after, keep going and building more and more information into that application dependency map. So you don't have to wait six months to do the job. You can do it sequentially as you go through the year. Now. So wait a minute. Hey. So I can run this sequentially. Yeah. But to handle Yvonne's question, all right, so you turn this on. OK, so you run it, you turn it on, and then your quarterly run occurs. But because you've turned it on to block stuff, your quarterly run fails. So I'm, I'm missing something, I think. No, no, no. This, this, is, this is right, actually. So um, it really depends how the customer wants to do their migration to whitelisting. Mm -hmm. So let's take a customer that is quite risk averse. Then they can build their policy, and then they can monitor it without deploying anything into their environment. So I have to monitor for like a whole quarter? You can monitor for a quarter. I mean, okay. in migration product, in migration projects, often a, a quarter is a, a blink of an eye often. So um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they Not sometimes. When you're under attack. <laughs> <laughs> now, that being said, we actually track packets that get dropped into Tration. So let's say that you, you monitor for a, a just one month and you deploy the enforcement. And now some flow starts generating traffic, and that traffic gets dropped. We capture that, and we send that via a message and in the user interface to the customer to say, look, this traffic is being dropped. It doesn't match with any rule. Do you want to do something about it? Do you want to add it to your policy, or is this traffic that you expect to be dropped? So OK, yeah, at first it's going to drop. That is, unfortunately, the, the way that whitelists work. But <laughs> we can, down the line, help them remediate that. And they have the knowledge to make those changes. They're not in the dark. It's not like it's going to wake up and they have to wait till someone calls them up to say that that packet's being dropped. Yeah, by that time, the phone is already ringing because the quarterly batch can pay. <laughs> yeah, the CFO's not, yeah. not happy. <laughs> yeah. And, this There's nothing you can do. We're just pointing this fact out. <laughs> no, so, so this, this slide actually kind of uh, is a great segue into this actual topic, which is okay, ADM works fantastic when you have all of the data in your hands. But often there's data that's uh, captured outside of the network. There's some human level policies that uh, need to be enforced inside your, your data center. So what you can do is you can overlay human intent into each application that gets merged with the application dependency map. So let's say there is a quarterly batch job that runs, and someone probably knows that that batch job runs. So all they do is they just layer one piece. If you're lucky. Okay, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> someone probably does. <laughs> let's say, for example, that they do know, then they just overlay one extra policy that gets merged with the ADM data, which is always open up this particular batch job on, on this port. So if there are some things that they know are critical that they haven't seen yet, they can plan ahead for that. How do you handle a situation where you're constantly having new types of traffic introduced over time. Can you be proactive about that? If you know that you're going to start doing some particular new type of application, you preload somehow? Is that what you would do? Or Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of different ways that you can handle this. So, so number one is that you can, uh, via the API, push policy directly into Titration. So let's say that a customer deploys Titration. They're using the enforcement throughout their entire enterprise then they can have part of the process to deploy a new application is that they build the policy and push that into the API ahead of time without having to rely on ADM. 
AM often is used in migration scenarios where they don't understand the application. For a new app, they probably know who should be speaking to whom. Probably, again. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> Developers. Now, there's, there's other types of apps as well, which is an app that exists already, and then they have a tier that might be a scale-out tier. So today it had five endpoints, but tomorrow there's a good chance that tier scales out to 25, and then when the traffic goes back down, it comes to five. So you can hint to Tration with uh, what we call um, filters and say, you know, these are the five IP addresses today, but I expect this whole subnet could actually be filled up to uh, be part of this tier. So you can give it hints ahead of time that application traffic is going to change. Yeah, I was wondering if you'd come up with something like that for this case of running once a quarter, once a year sort of scenario where you could give it hints that, hey, expect to see additional east-west traffic because, okay, during the quarterly run, there's a new quarterly backup that's made. It goes to a different server, for example. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. You can give it as many hints as you want. Okay. And you can overlay hints in different places. You could do it on a per application basis, or you could do it across the data center. You can write one rule in titration that says, yep, every single application, by the way, is now going to speak to a new backup server that we just deployed. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go around every app. I just write that rule once, and it gets distributed to every app. Well, this sounds great. But usually these things don't move anywhere because there's so much work involved that no one ever invests the time to set all this up. Yeah. So, so how do we solve that problem? Well, the, the way that we're trying to solve it is by automating as much as possible. So the time often in the past was that it was hours and hours and hours of human work to understand the dependencies. So that really, by understanding the dependencies automatically, you've got like 90 8% of the job done for you. And then the other bit, which is just overlaying your human intent, at that point becomes pretty simple. Um, now, it's going to vary on a per customer by per customer basis. Um, but we found most of the time that they've um, consumed titration pretty easily and that they haven't had much trouble getting that extra data into it. Obviously, it's not going to be a, f a free lunch. You have to put a little bit of effort into it. But the rewards, I think, by leveraging the platform, you get kind of uh, um, an exponential uh, in increase in how much effort you put in, you get more effort out of titration. Yeah, and the other caveat worth pointing out is that you are documenting existing mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, well, then you, you are enforcing whatever you've seen. You document the existing, uh, I, I'd never say our customers have messy applications, but you, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> you document the existing traffic <laughs> profiles, <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then what it becomes is a living document, right? Because as the application changes, the profile changes and titration updates, rather than having some Visio diagram that by its nature is going to be out of date as soon as you press save on that document. So bringing the two closer together is always going to, going to be a good idea. Sure. Now, the, the, um, the way that we can actually sure. write... There's a good question. Is there any uh, integration or something of, with OpenAppID that looked like the good idea with the firepower? where who, whoever writes the application writes also the open iPad signature to recognize the application? So we don't have an integration with Firepower to recognize the application yeah, today. Yeah, you have open up ID. Have you ever heard about this project? I haven't. The Cisco's project. Is this, is this a project where they look inside the payload to identify based on the, uh, Not really. It, uh, the idea is uh, whoever writes the application write the signature to recognize the application. So you can import that on your Firepower IPS, but it's an open project. So it may be useful to import that on Tetration so you can uh, recognize the application. 100%. I mean, I haven't heard of I don't know if the project, project is but alive. But it definitely makes sense to do that. So some of our customers who have already deployed ACI networks, for example, where they've done some of their EPGs and contracts, they can use the API on ACI to extract that information and push it directly into Titration without having to go through the dependency mapping stage because they know a lot of that information already. So same thing for a, a project like this. We'd be more than happy to, to reuse existing data that customers know about. Everything is open inside Titration when it comes to the, the APIs. Now, you can start to write policy that is not linked to forwarding attributes. Because we know identity about endpoints, you can write very simple statements that are uh, automatically resolved into actual forwarding constructs. So let's say that you have a really simple 
uh, phrase inside iteration. Production doesn't talk to non-production. Now, how you deploy that is uh, in, deploy that in a traditional network is very hard. You have to make an ACL and work out well, which IP addresses match production, which a IP addresses match non-production, and then go through and change those every single time someone makes a, um, a change to those endpoints. Now, using the identity repository, Iteration is constantly updating what the policy or what the rules resolve into. And if I tag an endpoint as production one minute, and then I tag it as non-production the next minute, Based on that change in identity, Tetration recalculates the rules that get pushed down to the hosts and updates the segmentation. So that like, data center is constantly evolving at any time of day without any input from humans. It makes it much more self-driving. So you were saying that I'm blocking this packet today, but tomorrow I'm going to let it through? Correct. How do I know that? So your intent, is, your intent is very simple. Your intent is production doesn't talk to non-production. OK, so that's OK. Yeah. Got it. And then all that changes is that the workload yesterday. I was, thinking, and I was going back to the previous problem we were discussing. OK, is this a, some magic here that could allow that to happen? And oh, there's so much magic, the magic. concentration. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> all right, got it. So to prove that it is not magic, let's, uh, okay. let's actually look at the, the product itself. So um, here is a application dependency map. This is a map of a, uh, a pretty simple application that we've deployed in our lab that has um, uh, a couple of different web applications, uh, some shared NFS storage, some shared uh, MySQL databases, uh, it uses Active Directory, it has Ansible for configuring the endpoints, and it also has uh, uh, campus devices connecting into the application. So if I look at this, here for example I can see, well, we're allowing SGT tag 16 into both our WordPress tier and our OpenCart tier. And I can also see by mousing over, let me see if this could. In this setup, you have agents installed on all these systems, right? Uh, yes, correct. We have an agent on all of the hosts in this environment. Um, it's not a necessity. You could have just the software, uh, sorry, the hardware sensor to collect this data as well. So. Here I'm seeing that uh, yeah, SGT16 is allowed to access the open cart tier of this application. We've identified the consumer and the provider relationship, and we've also identified that the only port that should be open between those two is port 80. Now, if I look inside the open cart tier by clicking on the particular icon, if I come uh, back here. And what else is feeding data into this, this demo? Uh, so that's a good question. One of the other things that we have feeding data into this demonstration is metadata from load balancers. So if you look here, there is a little icon of a load balancer. It's not so clear. That identifies that uh, really, when we go from, the, uh, from, the, from this tier to that tier, you actually go via a VIP on the front of a load balancer, and it goes to the back end to uh, resolve that request. So it makes you understand that the logical segmentation is SGT16 to OpenCart. But on the wire, we're going to see two separate TCP flows. Now, you can see that there's a couple of different components that are shared. We don't have to map every single shared service into titration. NFS is going to be reused by every single application. So like we were saying, the more that you use titration, the more effort that you put into it, the more it understands about your infrastructure, and the less that you have to map for every application. My NFS store that I've mapped once gets reused into every single app. I can even come to a different application from the perspective of the shared app. And I can see that the NFS server is actually being um, accessed by 10 different consumer applications. So we get kind of um, the gains of understanding that shared piece of infrastructure. It also means that you know, when the customer says, I need to upgrade my NFS storage, they can come to this dependency map and they can say, these are the 10 people I need to call and warn them that this, their application is going to have some downtime. Now, if I come back to my Pod01 application, what I can see is more details about these endpoints. Actually, in that scenario, if it was a different environment, you would still see that if the agents weren't installed on the clients, but only on the NFS server? Yeah, so titration only requires one arm of okay. the communication to monitor it. For enforcement, can you do it with 
just one side of the conversation? Yeah, you can do one armed enforcement as well because titration controls ingress and egress policies. Cool. Now, all of this data, exportable. I'm not going to lock you into my platform. Um, so if you so desire to take this titration policy out and put it into AWS as security groups and security rules, or you want to put it into ACI or maybe even some other vendors, um, controller, this is the policy that you need to do to program those rules. But you don't export for Amazon, you just export in this format, then you would convert it? So we export in the generalized format, okay. and then we have different applications to convert. So on GitHub, we have converters for AWS, we have converters for other vendors as oh, well. Cool. It was always JQ. Oh. When you have the data, the world, it's, it's up to your imagination at that point. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm going to come back to my um, application here. So this is, the, this is the model that we are going to enforce in my environment. Anything that doesn't match this by virtue of a whitelist is going to be dropped. Um, so looking at my policy analysis screen, I can understand what traffic is going to be matching my whitelist policy, what traffic is on my network right now that's not matching my policy that would get dropped if I went ahead and enforced this policy in my network. So ideally you'd be seeing no drops in this. Exactly. Before you press the big button to enforce, you want this graph you want to be like this yeah. and be blue. So when we've done the baseline, we've created this whitelist policy, and let's say I've applied it. But I mean, in inevitably, there's going to be new IPs on the network, new hosts, some of them are going to be ephemeral. Does Tetration analyze all that and, and, and adjust the whitelist for me on the fly? Or am I expected to, to tweak this thing by hand now and again? Or So it's kind of, kind of similar back to the previous answer, where there's a number of different ways that you can tell Tetration that you expect the application to change. So you could say, today you, you recognized five addresses in this subnet. Change that from five unique addresses to just say anything that falls into this subnet, apply the policy automatically to it. Or you can use the identity repository to send in tags about endpoints that come up in your environment. So you could tag it as it's part of this, this web tier, so when it comes online, make sure that you apply the policy web tier to it. But uh, this is day two. Sorry. Well, by tags, do you also mean like you can, from whether it's in vCenter tagging VM or in AWS tagging uh, VM AWS? Yep, you can. We call them annotations in titration. Uh, annotations, tags, labels, they basically mean the same thing. And the source of that data is up to you. So we have some native integrations, for example, to pull directly from vCenter or pull directly from AWS. But let's imagine that you wanted to pull from some other in house developed uh, virtualization environment. You can send that into titration over the API. What about something higher level like a Docker container tag? Yep. Yeah, so that's my question. This is data plane driven. Can you plug in, in something like Kubernetes services and get the context of the data? Yeah, so um, you can do it today via the open API. And looking forward to uh, releases later down the line, we'll be directly integrating with Kubernetes to bring annotations in automatically from uh, deploy containers into Tetration. So from which sources do you already bring in the annotations? We've seen vSphere, anything else? Yeah, um, I will, this was in the, the first section, but okay. the, this is the list of vendors that we have available right now today where you can, where you can deploy it uh, with a pre-existing um, okay. connector. Thank you. It's not the limit. And if you have ideas, I'll be more than happy to chat with you afterwards. So back in your network diagram, yes, um, you had pretty much everything talking on a single port. Uh, that was just so happened to be what I looked at. <laughs> so for example, we here, database. Yeah, do you have another example that has multiple ports? Uh, yeah, um, from, from okay. the uh, OpenCart tier to the titration collector tier, 5640 and 5660. And so we also I, have. So where I'm going with this thought is, is in a complex network, what you'd really like to do is, okay, so what if there's a piece of existing malware there and you're whitelisting it? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> how do you go back and validate? It's, it's kind of getting to, I guess, mm -hmm. where Ethan was going with some of his thoughts here, uh, where I implied he was going, was um, 
what do you know about the application? This gives you an idea. How do you go and validate that that's actually correct? So right now- Give me tools on, to help me yes, do that. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're gonna be <laughs> shipping like more tools yeah. later on, which will help you understand more okay. about the actual process that's generating these flows and potentially correlating that to a database of known bad processes, for example. That is okay. something that we could do. Excellent. Um, Good Maybe idea. at the end of the session, if we have a few minutes, we'll talk about that roadmap okay. item. Okay, so uh, now we come back here. I want to make sure that we get this in. So how does it actually work? So you take the intent, which is written in pretty, uh, pretty human-like language, either automatically via the ADM rules or by overlaying your own rules into that, and titration is the one that takes the, the dirty work of working back out, well, what are the IP addresses of those particular hosts right now? It knows who's production, and it essentially compiles that down into a list of IP addresses that we can enforce inside the host base firewall. It is a gray list as well, so you can either do it in a whitelist way, you can do it in a blacklist way, or you can actually combine allow and deny rules to come up with very, very unique ways of saying, you know, I'll, I'll allow these five endpoints apart from this one when it matches this criteria on this day. Now, we also have a concept of processing rules asynchronously from each other. So the, the holy grail that a lot of customers are trying to strive for is to give autonomy to the application owners, but at the same time, control them in some way, sandbox them in a sense. And what's very difficult in a lot of environments is you only have one place that you can put policy in, and therefore everyone has to synchronize with each other to make sure that the right people get the right precedence. Now, in titration, we allow the customer to capture their policy intent asynchronously. The application owner can write their rules. The network team can write their rules. The infosec team can write a different set of rules. Based on who has the priority, and we, uh, we let the customer customize this based on their business rules, if there are clashes between those different pieces of policy, whoever wins is whoever has higher priority and that's automatically resolved. So now you can say, yep, here's your workspace inside Titration. Build whatever you want. Connect your web tier to your app tier. Connect your database uh, to your load balancer. But if you try and open port 22 from your database to the internet, I'm sorry, as much as you try to do that, my rule is gonna take effect over your rule. And we have some really nice ways that you can look at that and troubleshoot it into Tration to understand the hierarchy of those rules. So how does it work? Well, what we do is we generate a policy per workload. So each workload has a unique policy. It's not a global set of policies. And we can scale today up to one billion policy rules across one titration cluster. Now, once those policy rules have been created, we push them out to the workloads. And the workloads can be anywhere. There is absolutely no limit where you put that workload. As long as you have access to the OS and it has layer-free connectivity back to wherever your titration cluster is, you can go ahead and enforce policy on it. So you can have one consistent level of segmentation across every infrastructure, and you don't have to play least common denominator to work out what can I do in all of these infrastructure environments. You get the most common denominator. Now, what does this look like? Everyone always likes to start off with a very simplistic ping. Most data centers, that's the main type of traffic I see being generated is pings. Um, so I'm gonna to come to my enforcement tab. And to enforce my policies across everywhere that I have my agent, I click one button. That's all I need to do at that point to deploy whitelist segmentation across anywhere that I have a workload. Now you see that it's dropped a little flag in here. It's dropped P1. So it's told me, at this point in time, you enforce the policies. And then it's going to monitor every single packet for compliance with those policies. Now what's nice is that you shouldn't see anything in your network at this point that is not permitted, because only the permitted traffic will be allowed. But we do monitor in case someone, for example, removes an agent, or they go and deploy a new host that hasn't been authorized to be on the network. We will see that traffic, and we will bucket into a number of different categories. If I come back here, you can see that my ping here died at sequence number 39. 
what I'm going to do is add some extra intent. Yeah, we are. You that the theme is dropped, the dropped, Yes. Yep. Um, let's add some. Let's add some. It will take the, the pipeline itself has about five minutes from the point that a packet is on the network to the point that it's available inside the UI to look at. So once we do the next section, we can come back and look at those things being dropped. Now I'm going to make one change to my policy because I, I love ping so much that I want to make sure everyone inside my pod is allowed to send ICMP. Now, this doesn't change the rules on the network at this point. So I could do simulations, I could do analysis, I could say what the, what's the effect of allowing ICMP, which traffic that was previously blocked is going to be allowed. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, have so much time today, so I'm going to live a little bit recklessly and um, enforce my policies. Now, that's going to recalculate the rules, and it's going to enable ping on that host. While that happens, you see here that I have a separate workspace called InfoSec policies. And that InfoSec policies applies to just the default scope, whereas my policies apply to the pod one application. So this comes down to the point where I want to overlay some policy as a security team that every single application owner has to inherit. So if I come and look, my ICMP has been flowing again for a while in the background. Now let's make a clash. Who usually wins between InfoSec and the application owners? <laughs> I'm going to put a deny. I'm going to say no one, not just in my pod one application, but anyone, any pod, pod one to 10, you are no longer going to be using ICMP anymore. Now I've enforced that policy. We have a clash. We have a clash between the InfoSec team and the application owner. And Titration is going to automatically resolve that based on who has priority. Now, how do I actually interrogate the system to find out what has been resolved? Well, first thing I'm going to do is grab this one. In fact, while we're doing that, you can see the sequence number right down here at the bottom has stopped uh, incrementing. So even though I didn't have to ask the application owner, we have uh, enforced some policy and sandboxed them. So by asking the titration system, I can say from my jump host to one of my applications, if I try and send ICMP, what is the policy decision? The decision is deny. And that actually shows me the hierarchy of policies that were applied from top to bottom. The pod 01 is saying that it would like to allow ICMP. My InfoSec policy is saying deny. I sit on top of the stack as the InfoSec team, and I actually am allowed to override the application owner and have that policy enforced. Big man. <laughs> You know me, I'm a control freak. <laughs> do, do, you, do you have a notification if you try to uh, insert a policy that uh, it uh, has a lower priority than the InfoSec team? Yes. If the application the owner now tries to enable again, you have some message? Yeah, in the policy analysis screen, um, when you go to do the analysis, if you are thinking that you're opening some port, but the InfoSec team is shutting a port, it will show you in the analysis before you go ahead and deploy that whitelist that okay. what you think is going to happen is not what's going to happen because someone above you is enforcing some level of policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, so once we've enforced the policy, we then continue to monitor it for compliance, and we do this from every single environment. I don't have to beat a dead horse at this point. It's very multi-cloud. We permit, oh, sorry, we group traffic into the four different groups, either permitted, escaped, misdropped, or rejected. And then we can send that data out via Kafka to uh, whatever you want to consume it from. Here is an example, and you can find more on our website. But what I want to wrap up with is, in summary, we're getting real-time visibility from Titration, information about every single packet in 
your network, both your on-premises and your cloud workloads. Using that to then generate very detailed application dependency maps with which you can overlay your own intent and simulate the effect of putting that map or that whitelist into effect in your environment. We can then take that and we can enforce it inside the agents themselves to enforce compliance and enforce policy no matter where that particular workload is. Now, one extra thing. Cisco Infiltration Analytics as a service. We are currently right now in EFT with select customers. It's a, f it's a further way of consuming the platform where you don't have to run it in AWS. You don't have to run it on premises. You can consume it entirely as a service hosted by Cisco. And we'll be providing more details about this later on in the year.